The stress of growth triggered a conflict in the community. Family, I believe in the text, and we'll see this later, that the conflict was already there, but revival exposed the conflict. See, I serve a God of peace, and my God of peace tears up all fake peace around it. Y'all know what fake peace is. We just go along to get along, but we ain't really alone. Yeah, God tears all that up. Great, family. So we're going to continue our series on revival culture. We've been talking about what revival looks like and what it is and what it feels like. And so we're going to continue on in that series. And I want to invite you to stand with me as we get ready to read the scriptures in Acts 6. We say participation is better than observation. So stand with me. Um, And I am going to start us off, and I want you to jump in when the water feels good to you. It said, now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. In the 12th. Pause. I'm going to read these names because the last, the last service got uh, was like, why you sent me out? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help us here. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip and Phocorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenius and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Great. Now y'all go ahead in. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this time and this moment that we get to have here. God, take this water, make it wine, meet the needs of your people. God, there are people coming in here today who can't even think clearly because of conflict. It took them everything they had just to walk through the doors. God, I pray that you would meet them right where they are. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, for our people. God, I pray for those who are weary. Give them rest. Let them rest in your presence. Breathe life into us on today. And God, we pray for revival. Pour out your spirit on all this flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. You all may be seated. You all may be seated. Family, I got a bottom line for you. My bottom line is if you go to sleep and don't, Remember anything that I said, if you take that rest thing seriously, right, (laughs) here's what I want you to remember. My bottom line is revival culture is not conflict free. Revival culture is not conflict free. So family, have you ever found yourself in an argument with no, with, with, with no people trying to find a solution? Have you ever been like stuck in an argument, stuck in a conflict, and you're not talking to each other, you're yelling at each other? It's almost like there's no end in sight. We just arguing, just arguing. I say it's black, you say it's blue. I say it's white, you say it's green. I say I want pizza. You say you want hamburgers. Like, it's just no end in sight. Family, I know a little bit about this. I have two daughters. They're beautiful little gifts of God. We're praying for their salvation, Um, right? Um, And what happens is both my daughters have very strong leadership 
characteristics. We see them. My daughter Ellie is a filler. She fills everything. She has both the filling sides of me and her mom all the way out there. She cries at the drop of a dime. And then my other daughter Ellie, I mean, my other daughter Naya. Naya is our dynamic woman. She has all sides of our rebellion, and I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it, how I want to do it. She gets that honestly from me and her mom as well. And so when you have two leaders in the room who are not submitted to the Holy Spirit, um, conflict starts to happen. Because we are strong leadership gifting, it's like rams locking horns for dominance. Instead of trying to agree together, we're trying to defeat each other. And so what we see in our daughter's lives is that we're caught in the middle of conflict from conflict to conflict to conflict. We tell our daughters, go upstairs and y'all play together. And then within five minutes, we'll hear, Naya, Naya. Naya, put that away, Naya. And we'll go, we'll go up and be like, what you, girls, why y'all yelling? Stop all this yelling. And they'll be like, Naya won't listen to me. And Naya's too, so she ain't really got her words together yet, but she, like her emotion tells, like her, the way she, like her body language speaks volumes. And Naya just get us look like. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, dog, y'all got to figure that out. Y'all gonna have to fight. Just fight it out. Just fight it out. Just fight it out. Now I got a hidden spirit. Y'all pray for her, y'all. She got a hidden spirit. So we trying to say gentle hands, gentle hands. Her and Violetta, they friends. They both got a hidden spirit, right? You know, we praying for them. Praying for both of their salvation. And it's like, I'm like, do y'all just like to argue? Is that like, y'all just, y'all like that? Y'all like to be in conflict? Get along. Y'all sisters. It's, when we gone, it's going to be y'all. And they just look up at me like, shut up, old man. Family conflict is everywhere. Conflict is on our job. Conflict is in our schools. Conflict is in our, in our home. Family, and there's even conflict in the church. Come on, we know there's conflict in the church. I like to sit over here and then, you know, somebody done took my seat. Right? Come on now, y'all. Y'all know y'all got y'all seats. Oh, Pastor Chris ain't here today. Why did I show up? You know, like, come on now, y'all. Like, let's, I'm being real. Let's be real here, right? Conflict is everywhere, and conflict is even in the church. And so sometimes I believe that we're in a series called Revival Coach. I believe that people pray for revival because they believe that revival will be conflict-free. So well, let revival happen so I ain't got to tell this person I don't like them. God saved them so I know that I don't want to deal with their sin issue. We pray for revival because we don't want to deal with conflict. But family, can I tell you that revival is not conflict-free? That there's conflict even in revival. There's, it's conflict. How do we know this? Because we see this in the text in verse 1. In verse 1, there's conflict in verse 1. It says in verse 1, now these days when the disciples were increasing in number, let me pause right here, right? This is revival culture. What we know from Acts 4, the hangover from Acts 4 started to continue to, to get wider and wider. In Acts 4, it says all believers were together and they gave all that they had to the apostles and they were increasing in number. And so that means that the churches kept growing and growing and growing and growing. People were being saved. Lives were being healed. People were being set free. Demons was being casted out. Revival culture is happening, and it's happening in mass. It's, it's amazing. It's dynamic. It is, it is like a dunamis. A dynamite went off, and the world was forever changed. This is revival culture. But with rapid growth comes growing pain. And it went from revival culture to a revival conflict. What happened was, it says, and the disciples were increasing in number, and a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. What they would do is they would bring all that they had to the feet of the apostles, and the apostles would distribute it to everyone who had need, and everybody had more than enough. But then that more than enough started to be just enough, and then people ain't get enough. And so now we got a conflict. And the sudden growth stressed the church's ability to care for people. 
It wasn't sin, but it was systems. The stress of growth triggered a conflict in the community. Family, I believe in the text, and we'll see this later, that the conflict was already there, but revival exposed the conflict. See, I serve a God of peace, and my God of peace tears up all fake peace around it. Y'all know what fake peace is. We just go along to get along, but we ain't really alone. Yeah, God tears all that up. And so conflict was brewing uh, beneath the surface. And so in the ESV, we see the word here, complaint. Complaint translates to um, rumblings or murmurs in the Greek. And as a leader, um, uh, whenever I see the word rumbling or murmur against people, I start to get a little bit worried because when there's rumblings, there's rumors, and rumors turn into rants, and rants turn into ruptures. When there's rumblings, there's rumors, and rumors turn into rants, and rants turn into ruptures. You know, we, oh, man, you know, this is not duck, this is not here, you know, but it's like, oh, you know, Gotta hurry up and get my kids in the ducks on time, you know. That's a rumbling. And then, you know, well, you know, they ain't never got nobody over there to take care of the kids, you know. That's a that's a rumor. And then, well, why every time I come here, ain't nobody taking my kid to the that's a rant, right? Now I'm gonna just go somewhere else. That's a rupture. Every revival movement that experienced a rupture started with an unaddressed rumbling. Every revival movement that experienced a rupture started with an unaddressed rumbling. And so, in, uh, uh, I want to help you read your Bible. Read your Bible every day. Every day, read your Bible. Read your Bible every day. Every day, read your Bible. Read your Bible every day. Sometimes to get a full picture of the text, we got to go to different versions, right? And so I want to go to the NLT because in the NLT, we, we, we see a different um, depiction of the scripture, a different translation, and it brings into fuller context what the reactions to the rumblings look like. And so it says in the, in the NLT, it says, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. Family, what was the reaction to the rumbling? First one, I believe, was disappointment. Man, I thought this wouldn't happen here, but it's happening here. Have you ever been to church and your needs didn't get met? Man, I, I just was searching all over, and I mean, I needed a word. I needed something, and I went in the doors, and it, I, I didn't, it, it didn't, here too? I thought I was supposed to be safe. I thought, you know, when I got with them, everything would be okay. And I got with them, and they, they lied on me, and they left me. And then now here it is. I'm disappointed. How did I get here? Then they were, they were disgruntled. Why is this happening here? The reason why they were disgruntled was because at the, as the custom, they gave everything they had to the apostles' feet. And so because they gave everything they had, they're like, now why my mama ain't getting fed? I gave everything. What y'all doing with the money? What y'all doing with the building fund? Where the money at? My mama ain't getting, ain't getting fed. Now I'm disgruntled. Then there was some diversity. Um, the reason why there was diversity because uh, um, there was Hellenists and there were Hebrews. Let me tell you who the Hellenists were. The Hellenists were uh, uh, Greek-speaking Jews from the Jewish diaspora. That means outside of Palestine. Hebrews were native Palestinians who spoke Aramaic as their primary language. And they were from Palestine. So there's a language barrier and a cultural barrier that instigated this conflict. And this conflict was well before the church was started to be formed in this moment. This was a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational gathering. Does that sound familiar? The first of its kind. Diversity. And the reason why this is a problem is because sometimes we pray for diversity, but we really don't want diversity. Say, oh, I want diversity. Diversity is a value, and we believe in diversity, and diversity is good. And so you start getting diverse opinions and diverse options. Now you're like, wow, we got all these choices. What happened to the choice I wanted? No, nah, we don't want diversity. You just want somebody that don't look like you to agree with you. That's really what it is. And then there was discrimination. Why should we care? 
Theologians posit that the rupture between or the rumbling between um, Hellenists and Hebrew was deeper than anticipated. Well, you know, they, they say they're Jewish, but they don't speak Aramaic. You know, they, they're more Greek than Jew anyway. You know, so they ain't really, ain't really one of us. You can go ahead and take that extra piece of bread. Well, you know, I go to Divine Unity Community Church, and, you know, we believe in this. And, you know, I don't really, you know, I don't know if I want to really relate with those people over there. Lastly, family, there, were, there was discord. And in discord, the question is always, why are we together in the first place? Why are we doing this? Unity was in danger and division was, was, was looming. Division was looming. And caught in the middle of all this, like me and my wife when our daughters are fighting, were the apostles. They're just looking like. Can we all just get along? <laughs> Family, revival culture is not conflict-free. Why is revival culture not conflict-free? Because revival is brokenness being on the move. So that means that my, that personal brokenness gets together with the collective brokenness of people creating a broken mess. I say this in Next Steps class. People are messy. And we wonder why people are messy when God made us out of dirt. It's just messy. And so we, when we pray for revival, let me, let, me, let, me, let me educate you. When you pray for revival, what you're praying for is God give me more mess. Allow the mess to become a message to your glory. Revi the revival is not conflict-free. It was a conflict in verse 1. And so then, yeah, I know it's tight in here. I know y'all looking at me like, oh, man, I really picked the wrong Sunday to come. Like, you know, so it's, it gets lighter. It gets lighter. Right? It gets lighter. So what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Sometimes I read Scripture and I'm like, okay, so what do I do with this? Right? What do we do with this? And so um, what happens is the apostles Show us a way forward through conflict. That conflict doesn't have to separate us, but actually our conflict can elevate us. Okay, y'all didn't get this. Okay, so let me say it over this side. Chris Jones, you listening. So conflict doesn't have to separate us, but conflict can actually elevate us. I'm going to put it this way, that our setbacks could be setups for our comeback. Oh, my goodness. That the obstacles could then be opportunities for the glory of God to be displayed. Y'all get y'all hear what I'm saying? And the balcony, right? So sometimes God will allow broken people and broken things into your life to help you become who he called you to be. If it wasn't for the conflict, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Pain and conflict are God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So what did the disciples do? So the first thing is they commit. Everybody say commit. So in verses 2 and 4, we see the commitment of the disciples. So what did the disciples do? Um, in verses 2 and 4, verse 2 says, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up the preaching of the word to, of God to serve tables. And so, and so in that, the first part of verse 2 says, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples. What the disciples did is that they called a huddle. They said, Everybody get together. Hey, everybody come inside. Let's get in the room. We're going to get together and we're going to figure this out. Um, calling a huddle in the midst of conflict, why is that important? Because when conflict comes, the first thing to go is community. We retreat to our corners. We choose a side and then we complain about the controversy. I was a football player and but what I love besides winning games and scoring touchdowns was the huddle. Because when we had long plays, we'd be like, huddle up. <sighs> you all right, big dog? I'm good. I'm good. 
I was a fat man, you know, I was a and fat man don't like running. So we had to do all that running. I'm like, hey, let's slow this down a little bit. <laughs> Might I let this help you, family? It's not even my notes. When controversy comes into your life, slow down a little bit. Call a huddle. Let's regroup. I love playing on offense because we told the defense what to do. That's a shout out to you, Kelvin. We told defense what to do. We slowed things down. The enemy wants us to get defensive, so we respond, but God calls us to be on the offensive where we are proactive. So when conflict comes to your life, slow it down a little bit. Take a breather. I love my wife. She'll go take a bath. Be like the, and we just understand. She'll go put the girls down to bed when it's her night, and she'll be like, deuces, I'm in the bath. <laughs> I'm like, go ahead. I get it. For me, it's video games. Hey, don't talk to me. I'm going to hop on this game because these girls is tripping. <laughs> Slow down a little bit. Pete Cesario in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, says you can't live at warp speed without warping your soul. Don't let conflict warp you. I don't even know where I'm going here, but hopefully this is helpful. So they were committed. So they were committed. What were they committed to? The first thing they were committed to was community. They were committed to staying together. They didn't choose sides, but they chose each other. Family, we got an election coming on. And what my prayer for us is when the conflict comes to our door is that we wouldn't choose Democrat or Republican, but we would choose each other. I thought, I thought this was Divine Unity Community Church. I thought people would clap there, but I guess, you know, maybe the political ideologies is a real thing. We choose each other. I don't care what your political affiliation is. If you're in this house, you're a brother and sister of Christ, and we're going to find a way to go together. We're going to stick together. I'm not going to allow discrimination. I'm not going to allow discontentment. I'm not going to allow discouragement to keep me from being in the family God called me to be a part of. I'm committed to the community. So many people complain about the division in the church. My question is, are you going to complain or are you going to commit? Commit to community. Then they were committed to the call. See, family, um, commitment creates clarity. In fact, you can't get clarity until you make a commitment. Because what your commitment will do when you say yes to something, you say no to something else. So I'm going to say yes to community. That means I'm saying no to division. I'm saying yes to community. That means I'm saying no to dissension. I'm saying yes to community. That means I'm going to find a way to stay united when the world is trying to pull me apart. You can't get clarity until you make a commitment. And might I just say that some of us are disillusioned and confused because we haven't made a commitment. Well, I really don't know what I want to do, and I really don't know where I want to go. And, you know, there's so many options, and it's options on options. I have options. Make a decision. <laughs> when I disciple fellas, I don't even know where I'm going here. When I disciple men, I'm like, hey, hey, bro, make a decision. Do you want this or do you not want this? Because if you want this, let's walk together. If you don't want this, I'd rather you tell me this now and go live, for, go live in the world instead of me wasting time to be with you. Make a decision. That's our curse from Adam. Adam was passive. It says in the scripture that and Eve gave to the fruit to her husband who was with her. So Adam heard everything Eve heard, but he ain't speak up. Our problem is, men, is that we're not speaking up. I don't even know where I'm going here. <laughs> Regain your voice, men. The world needs you to stand up. The world needs you to say something. When people are going down the road, don't just let them go, but stand up and say something. When I was growing up, they would say, let me put a bug in your ear. Hey, young buck, come here, young buck. Let me put a bug in your ear. And, old, and the older men would put their arm around me. And I needed that because my father died when I was 12. And so the older men in my community put their arm around me and said, hey, young buck, let me, let me. Hey, man, don't talk to your mama like that. You know, like, you know, like, you're a man and you're growing. And I know you got 
things, but yeah, that's not really the way to go, son. We need more fathers, not more teachers. Scripture says you got many teachers, but few fathers. I need the dads to rise up. I don't even know where I'm going here, y'all, but we're here. Um, where was I? Committed to the call. <laughs> Committed to the call. The, the, the apostles gained clarity on their calling. In verse 4, they weren't saying that they were too good to serve bread. They said that our calling is to teach and preach the word. And we can't be distracted from teaching and preaching the word by serving the bread. So what we need to do is we need to invite more people to get into the game. Because they made a commitment to community, it gave them clarity on their calling. Will you commit or will you just complain? And the last thing they committed to was a solution. The apostles were committed to fixing the problem. The solution wasn't systems, but it was people. They discovered that they needed to delegate responsibilities to more people to care for everyone equally. The apostles' decision to empower leaders here was one that still lasts and still active in our church tradition on today. Because they empowered leaders, that's why we empower leaders. And Jesus said it himself. He says, harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send workers out into his harvest. Jesus didn't tell, Jesus did not say, you go in and work the harvest because that was already understood. He did not say, go work harder. He says, no, pray for more people because the job is bigger than you. So my question again is, will you complain or will you commit? When revival comes and Broken and brokenness is on the move and people's lives are, are being revived and they're, and they're trying to get active to glorify God and all this other stuff. People just be complaining in revival. Why is all these people here? And why ain't, I ain't got my church seat? And why they always crying? And why they at the altar? And why the pastor preach so long? And they ain't really sing my song. Will you complain? Or will you commit? I know we over time, but maybe God's doing something. I know they always crying, but God touched them. God, you know what? Matter of fact, let me go ahead and get coffee with them to see why they always crying so that I might be able to help them realize something that God, I got a word for you. Let me help you, baby. Come over here, baby. Come over here, baby. Let me, let me, let's, let's go sit down and talk for a little bit. Will you complain or will you commit? Last thing and I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm going to get out your way. I know y'all like, oh, my goodness, is, what's going on? Called up, called up his last point. In verse 3, what the disciples did, they said, you know what, we're not going to hoard the responsibility, but we're going to freely delegate to other people. And right now, family, we're in this uh, NFL draft, NBA draft season, and, um, and I used to be a uh, character coach for, um, for football players, and, and I love draft season because in draft season, what ends up happening is, is that people start to realize their dream, and I always wanted to do this, and I always wanted to be here, and so I'm like, yo, this is dope, and so I love when my guys get, they go away, and they go get trained up, and they come back cut and fit and ripped and all this other stuff like that, and so when I see this, I saw guys. I saw God preparing his people to get drafted into work. And so what ends up happening is when they start, when they start figuring out who they want to select in the draft, um, the recruiters, what they start doing, they have a starting point. They say, you know what, here's where we want to start. Here's the areas that we want to recruit from. And this happens in the text. It says, therefore, pick brothers from among you. So what I love here is that the disciples, their starting point wasn't to go find somebody outside the doors. They said, no, the solution's in the room. <laughs> they said, we don't need to go hire somebody. We need to go get somebody. The solution is in the room. Might I say that the solutions to the problems we're seeing in the world and in our community and in our context are in this room? Might I say that you might be an answer to a prayer that was prayed so the solution is in the room? That God might put you in position to be in the proper place to impact somebody's life because the solution is in the room? The solution's in the room. 
Then they went from there and they said, you know, let's, 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 let's get the, we need a, 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 a selection criteria. What do we need on the team? What do we need? And the first thing that they said was that we need people of a good repute, people who have a good reputation, that, 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 that their name is good in the streets, as they would say where I'm from. Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they good in the hood. You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody knows them. They want to be around them. This is what we need on the team. We need people with a good reputation. What are we going to call these people with a good reputation? We got a name for them. They're called Influential Disciples. Yes, that's what we need. We need influential disciples on the team. That's what we need. Then they said the second thing we need on our draft board is we need people that's full of the Spirit. We need people who that's full of the Spirit, people who are abounding in and completely occupied by the Holy Spirit, someone whose soul is thoroughly permeated with the Holy Spirit. We need this people, this type of person is on the room that they have a lifestyle of prayer. They have a lifestyle of commitment. They have a lifestyle of doing their devotions. They read their Bible every day. We, and then not only do they read their Bible, but they live their Bible every day. We need this. What are we going to call these people? We're going to call them uh, incarnational missionaries. That's what, we, that's what we need. We need incarnational missionaries on the team. And then finally they said, we need somebody that's full of wisdom. That's full of wisdom. We need people, someone skilled in the management of affairs. We need somebody that has a special set of skills that knows how to get things done. What are we going to call them? We're going to call them, uh, we're going to call them innovative reconcilers. Yeah, that's what we need. Family, the reason why we say influential disciples, incarnational missionaries, and innovative reconcilers is not just a cool statement, but because these people are the solutions to the problems of the world. These people know how to get things done for the glory of God. That's a great place to clap. I mean, y'all, y'all just looking at me like it's okay. Incarnational missionaries, influential disciples, the innovative reconcilers are solutions to conflicts in the church. They move through brokenness to bring wholeness. And then we see the draft day continues, and they select seven people. And for the first time, um, new leaders are chosen in the church. And these leaders eventually became to be known as the first deacons of the church. And the word deacon is mentioned in the text as dolos, right? Um, and so in that, and that means to serve or serving. And so in that, deacons were presented in the church. And, and these deacons were also multicultural because five of the deacons were from the Hebrew camp and two of them were from the Hellenist camp. So for the first time in church leadership, we see diversity in leadership. Can you imagine what these men felt when they got the call? You want me to serve in the church? You want me to, yeah, I'll serve. The reason why this resonates with me is because my daughters, they, I don't know, I, I, I forget that they're church babies a little bit, right? You know what I'm saying? And so they're raised in the church. They're like, Dad, you about to preach? Oh, we need to pray for Dad. Let's pray for Daddy. Dad's about to preach. And he's like, Daddy, I just love it when you preach because you just be up there, you just be talking, you be yelling, and you know what? And I know Daddy yelling right now. <laughs> and then my daughter says, Daddy, I want to preach someday. Mm. Oh. I'm like, baby, maybe you will. Family at Duck, our church structure, we have deacons, we have elders, and we have gatekeepers. We have chosen from among us, and we're still choosing from among us because we know conflict is coming. Instead of complaining about the problems in the world and the church, we're committed to finding the solution. And the only answer to the problems of this world is Jesus. It starts with Jesus. It's sustained through Jesus, and it ends with Jesus. Family, our desire is that we want to meet the real problems of the world of real, with real people who have real problems and real help searching for real answers. My question for you on the day, as I get ready to close, is what part do you play in this? People need a faith that they can see and not just hear about. Some of you in this church on today, you're, you hear the rumblings. You see the conflicts. You know the people that's not being served, and yet you haven't gotten in the game. Might I tell you on today, you're being called up. 
that, that you are an answer to a prayer. You are an answer to a solution. And that we will never be who God has called us to be if you are not part of the equation. You're being called up. The question is not when conflict happens, but not if conflict happens, but when conflict happens, will you answer your call? God is on the line. You might be the next pastor. You might be the next deacon. You might be the next leader. Will you answer the call? The result of being called up is multiplication. Let's go to verse 7. In verse 7, it says, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the, of the disciples multiplied greatly. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Revival culture redeems conflict. Revival culture does not run from conflict, but revival culture runs towards conflict. Why does revival culture run towards conflict? Because their revival culture has the answers to the questions. Revival culture steps in conflict. Says there's a better way. Why does revival culture step into conflict? Because there was a man who descended down 40 and two generations because he heard some rumblings. He heard the rumblings of discontentment. He heard the rumblings of disappointment. He heard the rumblings of disgruntlement. He heard the rumblings of discrimination. And he heard the rumblings of discord. This man knew he wanted a diverse people to be a part of his body, so he incarnated himself and became the incarnational missionary, the influential disciple, the innovative reconciler, because he heard the rumble. Not only that, this man had some rumors spread about him. They talked about him in the streets, Chris. They talked about him in the temple. They talked about him so much that his disciples said, who is you really, man? And then the rumors then led to a rant. And then he was beat all night long. He was whipped all day long. He was persecuted. And it says in Isaiah that the stripes on his skin are my healing. He went through a rant. This man, his name was Jesus. He went through the rumors, rumblings. He went through the rumors. He went through the ranks. He, he was nailed to the cross. He was hung up there. And he was stretched out wide. He hung his head. For me, he died. That's love. But that's not how the story ends. Because three days later, a rumbling started to happen. A shift started to happen. The grave was rolled away. And revival came out. The Bible says that revival came out. I'm so glad that Jesus steps into my conflict. I'm so glad that Jesus sent people to step into my conflicted self. And then I became a revived life, active to glorify God. The question is, what part do you play in this? The call is simple. For some of you, you need to know this Jesus. You're like, Marcus, I'm conflicted, and I need to know who Jesus is. But for others of you, you're like, Marcus, I need to answer the call. Jesus is on the main line. Will you answer the call? Thank you.